Okay, so one of the reasons is the time dimension. And I say that we have much more control uh, as consumers over producers than we as voters have over politicians. And the reason is, just in terms of time, I don't know what, how often the vote occurs here. I think it's maybe the parliamentary system in the U.S., which, with which I'm most familiar. It's every four years. So if we don't like Donald Trump, and a lot of us don't, but you know, I didn't like Hillary either, <laughs> um, we have to wait four years. And uh, to impeach is uh, very rare in the U.S. and I think in most places. So it's, uh, it's a four-year stint that we've, we're stuck with whoever we've got. Whereas in the market, uh, market uh, activity occurs every day. Uh, maybe not every minute, but or maybe every hour, or certainly every day we can buy or sell something. So we as consumers have a lot of control over producers. If we don't like what they're doing, we give them a thumbs down and, and they make less profits. And if they keep doing things we don't like, uh, they lose money more and more, and eventually they have to go bankrupt, and then they start producing something else or become workers. But the point is that we have a lot of control over them, whereas we don't have control over politicians. Suppose we decide we're too fat, we want to go on a diet, and that means we have to have more rabbit food and celery and um, carrots and things like that, and less uh, food that makes life worthwhile. Uh, there are two ways to accomplish this task. One is we uh, write to uh, the Prime Minister or to Donald Trump and say, you know, please, Mr. Trump, or please, Mr. Prime Minister, tell the farmers to stop producing this stuff and start producing that stuff. That's one way to go. Another way to go through the market is we just start buying more celery and carrots and less chocolate and cake. And the prices in celery and rabbit food go up, and the profits go up there, and the profits and prices of chocolate go down and ice cream. And then farmers are led by Adam Smith's invisible hand to start producing what we want. And it occurs automatically without any fanfare, and uh, we don't appreciate that. Somehow we think that if it's going to be done, it's got to be done through the political system, and the political system is... Uh, not as um, spontaneous and not as effective. Okay, the second one uh, is a thing called rational ignorance. You're thinking of going and buying a motorcycle or an air conditioner or whatever it is you're thinking of buying. You'll ask your friends about it. You'll uh, consult with consumer reports or good housekeeping seal of approval. I'm, I, Hope I'm not insulting anyone. All my examples will come from the US. Uh, probably there are the equivalents of that in Denmark. Namely, we'll become knowledgeable about it, and uh, we will then make a, as good a choice as we can. In the political sphere, a guy with a PhD in economics or political science gets one vote, and uh, a low information voter gets one vote. And the low information voter has no incentive to become knowledgeable about what's going on because he or she only has one vote, whereas in the market, your one vote is definitive, whereas in the uh, political scheme, you have one out of many, many millions of votes. So that would be another advantage of the market vis-a-vis -vis the political uh, system. I was talking to some friends of mine before, and they said it was very windy outside, and I said, that's the government's fault. <laughs> In my view, everything is the government's fault. <laughs> Why? Because they take half the GDP away, well, in this country, more than half the GDP away, and with their half of the GDP or more of it, they uh, engage in all sorts of regulations which make us even less productive than otherwise. So my claim is that if you want to have a cure for cancer, I'm serious about this, if you want to have a cure for the wind or cancer or underarm uh, uh, odor or whatever it is, it's the government's fault because they're taking so much of the GDP away and if they weren't, we would be much richer and much more able to cure cancer or do these other great things. Okay, another one is unanimity. In the market, there's unanimity. I bought this tie for 20 bucks, let's say. And there was unanimity between me and the guy who sold me the tie. He agreed to sell it to me for 20 bucks, and I agreed to pay him 20 bucks for it. 
we had unanimity. And every uh, last example in the market is one of unanim unanimous agreement. In government, there's no such thing as unanimity. There's uh, the majority and then there's the minority and the majority gets its way. Well, imagine if we had to have a vote as to whether I could buy this toy or you could buy the, the bicycle that you ride around in. That would be very different. So surely unanimous agreement is preferable to um, voting and, and some people win and some people lose. It's okay to win and lose in poker or in basketball or something, but in uh, something uh, other than that, we want unanimity. Unanimity is the ideal, whereas being voted down or even on the winning side uh, it is not good. I mean, suppose we all had a vote as to whether I could buy this tie. It would be a pain in the neck and it would be a sort of a violation of my rights because I want to buy this tie and, and you vote against the red tie or something like that. That would be highly problematic. Another one is uh, conflict reduction. In the marketplace, it's peaceful. We don't have to fight with each other. And in the public sector, there are all sorts of um, tuckings and pullings and pushings, and uh, my side's going to beat your side, ha, 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 and uh, there's conflict. For example, should uh, students be allowed to pray in school, forced to pray in school, or not? Well, if it's a government school, we have to decide that, and everybody has to be either forced to or allowed to or not allowed to, and it's sort of a one-size-fits-all. I mean, if you're in a public school, you have to do it this way or that way, and, and that's it, and somebody's going to win and somebody's going to lose. On the other hand, if we have private schools, your private school does this, your private school does that, everybody wins. So there's much less conflict. And it's not just public schools, it's, um, I don't know, streets. Uh, one of my books is We Should Privatize the Streets. I won't go into that in great depth, although later, maybe during the question period, I could. But there was this case, should the Nazis be allowed to march in Skokie, Illinois? It was a, a Supreme Court case. And there were a lot of Jews there, and they didn't like it. And on the other hand, the, the Nazis wanted free speech and liberals want to support them. But the point is that if you have public streets, you have to decide one way or another. Whereas if you had private streets, well, the Nazis can march here, but not there, kind of a thing. Or bicycle paths. Everyone's riding a bicycle here. I'm <laughs> amazed at how many bicycles there are and, and all the paths. Well, should the paths be this wide or that wide or this wide or narrower? By the way, bicycle is, is um, what's the word? Uh, anti -age It's ageist people my age have a lot of trouble riding a bicycle, and, and uh, I'm kidding here. I'm uh, not fully serious here. I, I have to accuse somebody of ageism or something, otherwise I don't have a, a good day. <laughs> uh, museums. Right now, I live in New Orleans, and they just knocked down the statue of Robert E. Lee and a few other things, uh, other statues, Beauregard and, and other Confederate-type people. Well, should the museums have Confederate flags in them or not? It's got to be one way or the other, and if it's a public museum, we're going to have a vote, or maybe the mayor will decide, and then we can get rid of him in four years or not. But the point is, if we had private museums, you know, this museum would have this, and that museum would have that, and the third museum would have something else, and there would be much less conflict. And conflict, needless conflict, needless fomenting of conflict, I think is problematic from an ethical point of view. We'd live a much more ethical life if we didn't have to compel each other to either have the Confederate flag or not have it or what have you. Okay, another one is, if we have free enterprise, we will enable you socialists to do your thing. You can have your commune, your uh, kibbutz, whatever it is, on a voluntary basis. So we free enterprises will allow all sorts, uh, as Uncle Mao said, let a thousand flowers bloom. We can have many, many different kinds of uh, organizations, including socialist ones, voluntary socialist ones, not compulsory socialist ones, but at least voluntary. Whereas under the... Um, uh, government uh, scheme? Uh, do you think we free enterprises are going to get ink or paper or anything like that? Of course not. 
Namely, we can accommodate other people in a way that they can't accommodate us, so surely that's another ethical reason for supporting free enterprise rather than uh, governmentalism. And another one is uh, paternalism. Uh, again, as I said, it's okay to be paternalistic toward babies or children, but not for adults. Uh, take uh, Social Security. You're too stupid to save for your old age, so we're going to compel you to save for your old age. On the other hand, if you're so stupid that you can't save for your, ol your old age, why are we letting you vote in the first place? Or if we're letting you vote, which means we trust that you're a sensible person, why are we compelling you with all these paternalistic sort of things? I spend half my year in Canada, and there they have compulsory uh, uh, bicycle helmets. You have to wear a bicycle helmet. Here, happily, I see people, some with helmets, some without. But that's just another aspect of paternalism. Uh, I think people should be free. I mean, I think it's more safe to have a, a helmet, but it, it should be up to you. And the same with seat belts and all these other nanny state kind of regulations, which would not occur in the free enterprise system. Look, suppose I open up a restaurant and I said, to come to my restaurant, you have to wear a helmet. <laughs> Who knows why? The waitress could spill something on you. Who knows? Well, we know what would happen to me. <laughs> my restaurant wouldn't do too well, which is all well and good. Although it might do well for some weirdo people that, that <laughs> like uh, helmets, you know, the helmetists, or, or if there are such people, I just invented them. But, uh, maybe, you know, maybe I'll, maybe I'll do well for a, a small sliver of the community. And that would be an aspect of freedom. Whereas if the government decides, they decide one size fits all, everybody either has to or can't or must or whatever. Okay, so those are some of the reasons why free enterprise is good and government is bad.